as Kevin said, my name is, or Kevin, Jason said, my name is Grace Kaufman, and this is my husband, Kevin, in the back. Um, and we've been attending here for a little while. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, we've been attending here for a little while, about a year and a half. Um, and i just tell you a little bit about our story um, of who we are. Kevin and I met um, in 2012, so it hasn't been that long. We've only been married a little over nine years, something like that. <laughs> we met a little bit later in life, um, and when we got married in 2013, we were 34 and 36. I'm pretty sure that's right. So a little bit married, a little bit later in life. We were 34 and 36. Um, and do you know what that means? <laughs> it means the clock was ticking. Um, and so we wanted to, to start a family. We knew that we wanted to start a family right away. Um, and so um, my talk this morning requires a little bit of group participation from one specific, um, from a specific group, and that's married men. Okay, so married men, I want to hear you answer out loud when I, when I ask you. So when we were dating, we discussed how many children do we want to have. And Kevin said, I want to have three. And I said, I want to have two, and then we will discuss it. And so married men, what does that mean? Two. Two. Bill's right. Two. Two. Okay. So, all right. So we, at 10 months, m mind you, we got married at a year and two months, 10 months later. So, no, that's, is that right? I forget. Anyway, 10 months into our marriage, we, um, we got pregnant for the first time, and it was great. Everybody was happy. We were celebrating. My parents had waited a very long time for this. This was their first grandchild. Um, and so we were really excited about that. Um, and we celebrated. We did all the things that celebrating that you're supposed to do when you wait a long time for something good to happen. And we did all of the things. And one of those things was that we had baby showers because we had not had it. This was our first child. And um, we got everything. <laughs> People were so excited. And I had two baby showers, and we got everything, including that car seat. It was one of those, like, super clunky, like, stroller car seat in and out combos. And, and my grandmother gave it to us. And so we filled our nursery and everything full of more than just the nursery, full of baby stuff. And we began to celebrate, and we celebrated for a long time, for nine months. Um, and as you're supposed to. Um, there was some difficulties along the way. I was at that point 35, which do you know what they call people who are th pregnant with after over 35? Geriatric pregnancy. Thank you. So because I was a geriatric pregnancy, there was a lot of extra tests that came with that. But the tests, every time we would go in, it was fine, it was fine. Um, I was like low on hormones and did some shots and struggled some with headaches, but mostly, like, there was nothing that was considered to be serious. Um, so on the week of the first week of May 2015, um, I went in for my 36-week checkup, and I had an ultrasound, um, and they said, okay, everything's good. It looks the way it's supposed to. You are far enough along that if you go into labor, we're not going to stop you. We're going to let you have this baby. That was on a Tuesday. On Saturday morning, I went into labor. I woke up, I was having minor cramps, um, went to the bathroom, my water broke. Pretty sure my water broke and didn't just pee my pants. And so we called the doctor and said, I think my water broke. We were living in Huntington, so 45 minutes from Fort Wayne and our doctor provider was up here in, at DuPont. And he said, come on up, I'm already at the hospital and we'll get you checked out, we'll put you through triage. So we arrived at the hospital around 9 a.m. and we didn't call anybody because I wasn't sure that I hadn't just beat my pants. And so, and the, like, I didn't, wasn't having like full-on contractions. So we, it was three weeks early. We were at 36 weeks and six days, so almost 37 weeks. Kevin puts, we weren't really ready. <laughs> we didn't have our bags packed. <laughs> so Kevin in, like installs the car seat and we throw stuff in a bag and drive to Fort Wayne and do all the things you're supposed to do and come into the hospital through the special baby entrance. Um, and we come into triage and the nurse starts hooking me up, hooking me up and can't find a heartbeat. And she's looking for it, she's looking for it. 
I can see her progressively becoming more and more uncomfortable. And they do what I know now is a baby birthing or a labor and delivery trick where they put the monitor so that it can hear your heartbeat. And she left the room and said, I'll be right back. Now, I had had so many checkups that I knew what was going on, that there was no heartbeat. Kevin had not been to us quite as many checkups, and he was like, it's going to be okay. You can hear my heartbeat. The doctor comes in. His name is Dr. Stroud, and he practices here in Fort Wayne. And he brought in his little rolly cart, which is a sonog like a mobile sonogram thing. He put it on my belly, and after less than a minute, he put his hand, my hand was on top of the bed rail, hand on my hand, said, I'm sorry, your baby has died. And it was utter shock. We immediately became zombies. Like, it was just, I remember thinking, like, it's not like 1812. What do you mean my baby's dead? Like, babies don't die at the end. They die at the beginning. Or you get told that there's something wrong with them. This doesn't, like, what are you talking about? And we started grasping for, like, well, can you take it out? Can we recess it? What, what can we do? No, he's gone. Um, and he suggested that we don't do a C-section, that we go through the natural, well, not natural, but regular birth process um, for my health and future health. And they moved us down the hallway to the room on the end to begin labor. Um, and so we went throughout the activities of that day, um, called our families and told them. And we went through labor, 14 hours. And we chose a new name um, because we felt like the one we had chosen didn't fit. Um, and I gave birth to our son, Joel Christopher Kaufman, 12.23 a.m., a little bit after midnight, which would have been May 3rd, 2015. Um, there was people who came and were present. Our family was there. Um, the port people were there. Nurses. So that happened at 12.23 a.m. We were holding our son and introducing him to our family for about three hours. This went on for a while until the wee hours in the morning, about two something, and people started to go home because it was two o'clock in the morning. Um, and it left just me and a woman who had come to support me and Kevin and a photographer. And I began to feel um, not good. And I said, I don't, I don't feel good. I think I'm gonna pass out. And I began to bleed and I started to hemorrhage and I struggled to remain conscious, and Kevin was in there, in the room, and the nurse came in, and she called the doctor, and the doctor was miraculously still on the floor because after my birth, he had had a C-section, an emergency C-section, and he walked into that surgery after mine, and then walked out of that C-section to come back to check on me before he left, and as he came back to check on me, I was crashing tried to stop the bleeding and he couldn't um, and he rushed me out of the room and at the door on the way out of the room I said goodbye to my husband and we were pretty sure we were never going to see each other again he took me down the hall and I was awake through an hour and a half surgery to save my own life and Kevin <laughs> turned around into a room that was now empty with the exception of our son who had already passed away in a bassinet in the corner and he hit his knees and prayed. That's who he is. And he spent about 20 to 25 minutes not knowing if I was going to make it until they got things under control and they sent a nurse to tell him. And then um, he at least knew that I was going to make it at that point. And it took a while longer for me to come out of surgery. Um, So that's kind of how that all happened. As you can tell, I, was, I lived. I made it. <laughs> um, and they brought me back to our, um, our hospital room, and I recovered there. 
um, and we did spend part of the next day saying goodbye, holding our baby, saying goodbye. Um, and that whole process uh, from the time he was born to the time that we had to say goodbye was less than 24 hours. Um, and they took him, and then I spent another day, about another 24 hours in the hospital just for my own physical recovery before I was allowed to go home. Um, and at that point, our story of grief began. Um, it shifted from trauma, what I would call the trauma of his death, to the long-term process of grief over our son. Um, we went home with no baby. And I think graciously, a family member of ours took the car seat out of the car so that we wouldn't have to drive home with it empty. And we took everything that we had for that baby and shoved it into his nursery and shut the door. And that's where it sat for a while. Um, the week we were supposed to be welcoming our baby home, instead we went and approved a burial plot at the name of the at the cemetery for a baby. I can remember standing there. And the weight and permanence of death was like nothing I had ever experienced before. There was no surgery, there was no chemo, there was no doctors, there was nothing that could undo this. People do not rise from the dead. It is the very definition of what makes Jesus Christ's resurrection a miracle. People don't rise from the dead. We were not going to get out of this. It was permanent. And I had never experienced anything like that before. I had lots of grandparents, but to be quite crass, old people are supposed to die. Babies are not. And so I was grasping for ways to make it stop, and it wouldn't. So about four weeks later, well, about a week before we had Joel, we had bought a four-bedroom house here in Fort Wayne, the one that we live in now. We had gotten approved for the home. Um, what do they call that? You sign contract or whatever. And Joel died between the time that we bought the house and the time that we closed on it. So we went to Fort Wayne and we closed on a four-bedroom house and eventually moved into it with no baby. A four-bedroom house with just me and Kevin and a full basement. Um, which meant that we had to take down his nursery and we packed it all up into boxes and literally black plastic tubs and shoved it in the corner of the basement of our new four-bedroom house and it sat there for a really long time. Um, and I, the room that was going to be the nursery, we just put a recliner in it and shut the door. Um, and life started to move on. Um, Kevin had to return to work. Um, he got about a week off, but he went back to work and we started encountering the difficulty of trying to function with what had happened to us and the way that the world continues to move on. It was really difficult. Um, we were in a completely different state of being than everyone else around us. Maybe not everyone else around us. Some of our close family members, I think, definitely walked through some of the level of grief that we did and some friends. But the majority of the world just continues to move on and I started experiencing things like difficulty seeing pregnant people, dif difficulty being around babies. Um, we experienced insensitive comments. Um, there was a general, it was so uncomfortable that generally people just avoided it. They didn't talk about it. Um, and we became a part of this community that nobody wants to be a part of. I've been told that people who have cancer kind of become a part of a cancer community. There's a group of people who have walked through this and you become a part of that. We became a part of the bereaved parents community during that time um, and I wanted a way out and so that fall I decided that I wanted another baby so I wanted another baby that fall which would have been fall of 2015 he died in May of 2015 fall of 2015 I decided another wanted another baby and Kevin did not want another baby and so married men what happened we had a baby, <laughs> okay. You're good, you got it, okay. So um, around Christmas of that year, we became pregnant. Um, 
and there is, they talk about this in this bereaved parents community that you think another baby will fix it, but it won't. And so now I was pregnant and grieving. It made it worse. And so I was trying to explain this to my mom, and she, she was like, I'm having, she just told me, like, that was kind of hard for her to grasp, like, shouldn't this fix this? Um, and I said, well, what if, you know, I was trying to think of a way to illustrate this. If you are, let's say that you have been widowed, and your husband always wore a certain cologne, a certain type of cologne, and maybe, you know, you can smell, you know, you've been widowed, and maybe you smell the cologne bottle, or you smell his clothing to remember him. And then one day, like six months later, you're at the grocery store minding your own business, and you walk past a guy, and he's wearing that cologne. You know, now what if, and you can imagine what that's like. It comes over you like a wave. Now what if you are adorned in his clothing all day, every day? And that's what it was like to be pregnant when I was grieving a baby. I was adorned in the smell of that which I was grieving on a daily basis. It didn't have anything to do with the value of the child inside of my belly. It had to do with the fact that I was unable to escape the reality of what I was mourning on a daily basis. So for nine months, to be quite honest, for the first four months, I managed it mentally like a medical problem until I got to the point where I realized I was going to have to give birth regardless. <laughs> um, and so I went, started to go to counseling for essentially what they told me was post-traumatic stress disorder um, and began to prepare for the birth of my own child. Um, but let me be very clear. We very much wanted our baby, <laughs> um, which is hope in the back room. We very much wanted that child, and we were very glad to be pregnant. But you can be both things 100% fully at the same time. And so we began to prepare for that. Um, and as the day got closer, we hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed about whether or not we would put the car seat in the car and whether or not we would put up a nursery because we didn't want to take it down. And so we, from the outside, I'm sure lots of people thought it was disturbing, but we, I allowed Kevin to put up the crib and the changing table. We, did, we decorated nothing, and we bought one outfit. And we were talking about it. We can't remember whether we installed the car seat or not. I ended up delivering Hope a little bit early. Um, they took her by a C-section four weeks early at 36 weeks on the day because she was breached and her feet were down and I was supposed to be induced and so they said we can't induce you that way you don't qualify <laughs> so Hope was born on August 16th um, 2016 and she was beautiful and she was wonderful and we got to bring her home in that car seat and it was great and we raised her and are continuing to raise her and that, until that car seat didn't fit anymore and we had to buy a new one and we put it in the corner of the basement in hopes that maybe someday there would be another one. What do you guys know about car seats? They expire. Okay, so this car seat, which purchased several months before my son was born, which would have been in like the fall of 2014, and Hope wasn't born until August of 2016, and now the clock is ticking. Not that we couldn't have bought another car seat, but you get my point. It's sitting in the basement along with every baby thing that she grows through goes in the corner of the basement for a hopes of the potential of another baby, except that for the first two years, I refused to talk about it. We're not going to have another baby. I can never do that again. I almost lost my life once. Hope's pregnancy was the most brutal thing I have ever walked through, literally equivalent to the death of my son. It was so hard. The last trimester of Hope's pregnancy, I was sticking myself with a needle 46 times a week between diabetes, hormones, and blood thinners. It was brutal. And I didn't want to do it again, and so for two years I didn't even discuss it. And so two years later, Kevin decides that he wants another baby. And I said, I don't want another to be pregnant again. <laughs> so married men, what happened? We did not. <laughs> okay, the truth is, is I went to counseling to try to, to grapple with the fact that my f husband was feeling that our family wasn't complete at that point. And I 
didn't, while I wanted potentially another child, I had wanted nothing to do with having another child. And had spent several months grappling with that. Um, and then um, we did eventually decide to start trying to have another child. And that went on for four years. We couldn't get pregnant, and we couldn't get pregnant, and we couldn't get pregnant, even though the other two had come. It might be too much information, but Joel was on the first try. So what is the problem? And we found out that I had endometriosis, and I had surgery to remove it, and we still couldn't get pregnant, and we couldn't get pregnant, and he told us that we had, I forget what it was, like between 9 to 18 months to get pregnant from the surgery, that that is your like window of fertility when they clean you out of this stuff. And the time was ticking. How many more months? How many more months? How many more months? Um, and we couldn't do it. It never happened. And some of you know that not this past Thanksgiving, not this one that just happened, but the year before, I had a hysterectomy. And so now we have lost the hope of another child, it, biologically, the hope of having another child. And now we grieve that too. Um, and it was hard, and it still is hard. Um, and we were grieving, and we still are grieving. And the car seat sat in the corner of the basement. And hope is six, and it expired. And we ran out of time. Um, seven weeks after my hysterectomy, I decided I want a puppy. I wanted a puppy. Kevin's not a dog person. Some married men. We got a puppy. We got a puppy. She's a year and a half old, and she's a giant idiot. I love her. 60 pounds of still puppy. Um, so last May, so it's only been it'd be a year coming this May. Last May, I decided to face my grief, and we sold 80% of everything that we saved for that next child in a garage sale. But you'll notice <laughs> that car seat is still there. Can't sell a expired car seat. You're not allowed. They tell you that you have to recycle it. But if you're going to recycle it, they tell you that you have to take a, a pair of scissors and cut the straps so that nobody can use it. And I said no, and I shoved it back in the corner of the basement. And it was still down there until this week. <laughs> and that's where it is. Um, and I'm telling you this story so that you realize that we did mourn the loss of our son, but we continued to mourn the loss of our son. And then we also mourn and still mourn the loss of our son and the loss of the hopes and dreams of a family that looked like we thought it would. I just want to say thank you for listening to my story, and Jason's going to come up. I'm back. Um, so if we're looking at this beatitude this week, this kingdom attitude, blessed are those who mourn. It's Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Talk about how this is upside down. It is difficult to grasp. And after you hear a story like the one I just told, and a hundred other stories I've heard. You might be hearing something like this. Mourning is a blessing, and I'm supposed to somehow miraculously find a way to be fine with it. As though a side hug and a pat on the head is a worthy consolation prize for my loss. That's what it feels like at times. That's what it, if you've never experienced mourning, and you're afraid of it, it's kind of what it looks like. Like, I'm supposed to be blessed by this? Oh, thank you. I'm supposed to be blessed by this? This is a blessing? And so if I say that, that morning is a blessing, and I'm supposed to be fine with this consolation prize, it's actually two fundamental lies in seeing it that way. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, but first, we're talking about kingdom attitudes. Um, 
grief and mourning has taught me a lot about this world's kingdom attitude, this world's attitudes and ways versus the kingdom attitudes and ways. And I wanted to share with you the difference because I think this is the key to what, to opening the lock of what this beatitude means and how we can help it to not feel upside down. Um, so I'm going to talk first about the world's ways, this world. This is what Kevin and I experienced after the loss of our son and as we walked through grieving. So the ways of the world versus the kingdom ways. The ways of the world. This is the world's truth or his ways or its attitudes that we walked through regarding mourning and grief and death. Self over others. When you interact with a person who is mourning, more often than not, we experienced that the person who wasn't mourning, not that, I mean, everyone mourns something at some point, but the person who wasn't in mourning in that moment, the person who wasn't us, more often than not put themselves above us. Their needs were more important. This looked like the minimalization of our pain. Kevin got told, you can always have another kid. Somebody said that to him. Out loud. Changing the subject. Why don't you just... Um, They're all attempts to avoid the truth and to, in essence, avoid the discomfort of encountering grief. It puts that person who feels uncomfortable over the needs of the person who is grieving. Self over others. And this is not unique to grieving. I don't know if you've noticed, but our culture is really selfish. You do you. Okay. So self over others. Um, grief has an appropriate timeline. There's books about this. Um, let me ask you, just answer these questions in your head. How long is it socially acceptable? Not how long does it, but how long is it socially acceptable to grieve a dog? One to three days? A week, maybe? If it's like a dog you had for 14 years? Until people are kind of like, We've got, you got to go work. Right? Probably not even, like, you don't even get out of work unless you're, like, taking it that day. You get that day. And then you got to go back to work. A grandparent? A couple months. A miscarriage? Maybe not at all. Don't tell anybody before 12 weeks. Not allowed. There's an appropriate timeline. If you have ever interacted with somebody who has had a loss and you have thought to yourself, why are they still talking about this? It's been 10 years. Or you feel uncomfortable with them expressing it. Or you thought, they seem stuck. Why isn't she dating anybody? That's what this is. It's our culture's, it's what we teach that grief is supposed to look like. At some point, it's done. And it would all be very convenient for everybody else if you would move it along. <laughs> That's what we teach. Grief only exists in certain times and places. Grief is for funerals, cemeteries, and at your house by yourself. That's what we teach. And other places like work, not so much. Baby showers, not so much. Christmas, no. Makes people uncomfortable. And that's, this is not the time and place for that. Um, and we had a lot of those experiences. And it was hard. And nobody was intentionally being cruel. This is how our culture functions. It's what we teach is appropriate. It's how we manage getting through. Um, Also, in this, at certain times and places, you'll see people maybe move to get away from it, 
change houses. Like some place, there's this line in a movie where he says, I want to move to a city where every time I walk around a corner, it doesn't remind me of her. The reality is, it goes with you. There is no time and place that is appropriate. Or there is no time and place where grief doesn't follow you. Um, mourning is bound by gender. Now, I experienced m way more support than my poor husband did. He's not supposed to cry. He's not supposed to show it. He's not supposed to talk about it. And he's supposed to be strong for me, even though his own son died. And he watched his wife come. I mean, he told me, you were the same color as him when they took me out of that room. This is what he went through, but he was largely ignored. Not by our family, but by our culture. We found this out in a very firm way when we went to a support group for um, bereaved parents. And we were sitting in the room, and one of the men said something about, one of the women said something like, do you guys even grieve? Like, do you even, like, I never see it. And somebody said something about crying in the shower. And every man in that room was like, yes, and alone in the car. Yes. Bound by gender. There are general expectations of people who are mourning that we're supposed to live by. Um, and that's just a lot of, they should, they should do this, they should do that. The divorce rate of, of marriages who lose a child is very high. And I heard a counselor say, you don't get, people don't get divorced because their kid died. People get divorced because they judge each other's grief and the marriage can't withstand it. Um, that's how it is, and it's not just married family, married people. It's family units and social circles. There's expectations of how we handle it and what it should and shouldn't be. Um, and for us, you know, it was, I wish you would come to this baby shower. Why aren't you at this funeral? You know, I, you should be able to handle these things. And there were moments and days that And the last one is that I've come up with. There's plenty. In the absence of known truth, we create our own. Um, death is scary and ambiguous and not totally clear, even in scripture. So I got told, God must have needed an angel. A number of times I've been told that my dead baby is now an angel. is comforting, but I'm, it's also wrong, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, maybe there's something, maybe there was something wrong, and this is better. This is better. We don't actually, we don't know why Joel died. We never got a diagnosis. We have no idea. Um, we didn't know, so people, you know, maybe something was really bad, and he would have been disabled, and this is better. And um, I was given a book by a woman at a small group at a church. This is a leader of a small group at a church. And this book essentially boiled down to, you could have prevented this. You can prevent marriage and stillbirth through faith. <laughs> if you believe it and pray it correctly, you can prevent it. And the saddest part about that story is that woman had had 18 miscarriages. And she walked around believing that they were her fault because she didn't know the truth. She didn't understand her scripture. This is a lot of our culture. We don't know the truth, and so we just fill it in because it's too scary. Just make something up that feels comforting. Not that the book was comforting. I'm just, it was comforting in the sense that maybe if I prayed the right thing, it won't happen again. This is what we do. But you want to know something about this? What is every, Kevin and I experienced that every single one of these things weren't true, which makes them what? A lie. They're lies. And who is the father of all lies? Satan. So whose kingdom ways are these? 
this is what we teach. This is what we live by. This is our general rules, and they're the ways of Satan's kingdom. You might call them chains of bondage. So this is what this looks like. Kevin and Grace, your baby died. Don't talk about it. Put it on another chain. Are you done yet? Put on another chain. There's probably a reason this happened to you. It might be your fault. Your grief is making people uncomfortable. Put on another chain. Oh, and by the way, while you're down there, find a way to be grateful for this because it's a blessing. The Bible says so. Do you know what this is? What kind of life this is? Tell. It's a living, walking hell. What we teach. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, I told you there was two lies about the way I was reading this before. Morning is a blessing, and I'm supposed to somehow be fine with this. And a side hug and a pat on the head is a worthy consolation prize for my loss. The first lie is that we're defining the word comfort wrong. Not a pat on the head and a side hug and a fussy blanket. It's not what it means. The definition of comfort is um, a state of ease and freedom from pain or constraint. Freedom, which means that it's gone. Okay? Freedom. Um, and the second part that was wrong, blessed are those who mourn, that blessing is a mourning. It doesn't say that. It does not say that blessing, bless, that mourning is a blessing. It says those who have experienced mourning will end up being blessed. Do you know what the blessing is? It's the comfort, not the mourning. You have every right to be uncomfortable and fear death and mourning because it is a reflection of hell. It's looking it right in the face. This is why people avoid it. We're looking it right in the face and bound by the chains of Satan's ways. That's what it says. Not that blessing is, that mourning is a blessing. That freedom is a blessing. And so now I've purposefully left out <laughs> the good parts of our story to make this point. And so I want to tell you about the good parts, the comfort, which was freedom that we experienced. Um, this is we experienced comfort, and it was freedom for us. And these are the things that we experienced that were comforting, that were freeing for us, the breaking of chains for us within our mourning. So kingdom ways regarding grief and mourning. Freedom. Freedom to feel and express however you are feeling, and freedom to be however you are. We had friends, a couple friends, that kind of came out of the woodwork. Their names are Hope and Jesse Brown, and they would invite us in those first few weeks to like go for a walk, go get ice cream. And they had no expectations of whatever state it was that we were in. Zero. And it was freeing. They, we, they just existed beside us and didn't need it to be different. It was freeing. We went to support group. It was hard and at times maybe not enjoyable, but it was the only place that Kevin and I experienced where we walked in the door that everybody got it. And you would say something like, somebody in the corner would say something like, I'm actually kind of relieved that my baby was born dead because it means they don't have a legal identity and nobody can steal it. And nobody in the room would bat an eye because that was everybody's normal. Yes, everyone here gets it freedom to be weird and say things like that out loud without being judged or having faces be, people's faces be like, what? Because that was our every day. And we needed a place to be free to be that way. Um, 
we went to counseling. Mostly me. <laughs> lots and lots of counseling. People who are professionally trained to sit in this with you. Um, and we had lots of fam friends and family who did provide these moments um, without any pushback or motive to cheer us up or speed it up. Um, they expressed interest. They asked questions. They let us be sad. Um, they sent notes. We experienced those moments, and it was like a breath of fresh air and a chain being broken. In those moments, it doesn't take it away. But in those moments, it eases and gives you freedom from how bad it really is. Presence. You know, they said on 9-11 that some people, most people were running out of the building and some people were running in. In our kingdom, we run in. In Christ's kingdom, he runs in. It's scary. It's terrifying. The night between the time that we found out that Joel had died and the time I had him, um, a woman from Kevin's, for the church that he grew up in, came and sat at my bedside. I have never met this woman in my life. She had had three full-term losses. And she sat at my bedside and answered every single question that I had, no matter how awful it was. She came in. She rushed in. She was present with us, and she was not afraid of our pain. One of my best friends, her name, I'm just going to call her by name. Her name's Mallory Harrigan. Um, I met her at Huntington when I worked there. She came into the hospital the day after our son was born. We had already sent him to the morgue. Um, and she came in, and Kevin and I were in the hospital. And she walked through that door, and she crawled into bed next to me. And she held me. Now, that was a bold move. <laughs> I wouldn't maybe recommend that move every, <laughs> in every relationship you have. There was... An, unbelievable expression of how not afraid of my pain she was and how willing to sit in it with me she was. She was present with me in my pain. And people showed small, you know, they broke small chains and they broke big chains. You know, Mallory was a big chain. My friend Kristen that visited with me was a big chain. But you can break small chains too. Notes, meals, Showing up, asking questions, being willing to pray, looking somebody in the eye, using the dead person's name. You're not going to remind them. They already know. Be brave. Be present. My sister-in-law, Kevin's sister, came and helped me take down the nursery and put it in tubs. She came. I actually had a lot of offers for that. I had people offer to do it for me if I didn't want to do it at all. It was freedom. Freedom from the hell that we were living. Last thing. I mean, it's not the last thing. The last thing that I have to say <laughs> about kingdom ways is truth. This thing that I talked about where people are just making stuff up, writing books about it, giving it to people in their small group. You might think, like, why can't you just let people think that they're babies and angel grace? Like, that's really comforting. Because it's a lie. <laughs> you know what scripture says? Our greatest comfort comes from knowing the real truth. Now, I will tell you, there's not a lot in the scripture about what heaven and happens after the after like the afterlife it's vague and a lot of kind of picturey language that isn't maybe 100% literal and if i if everybody in here wrote down the questions they have about what happens after we die we'd probably have a million questions and my 6 year old has asked me every single one of them this week she asked me if there was macaroni and cheese in heaven Every single one in the last year and a half. And you laugh, except that six months ago, she asked me if, if when God the Father was in heaven and he was planning for Jesus to die on the cross, was he talking about himself? This is what it's like. <laughs> it's like the insurrection at our house. <laughs> There's a lot of questions. But our comfort comes from knowing the truth. So what can we know? Death, disease, and pain is a result of the current state of our world, not a punishment or a lesson. From God. 
Death is a causational result of our choice of sin, both original sin and current. It's a causational result. It's not the punitive cruelty of an angry and resentful God. He set up boundaries to try to keep us from it. We walked around him. We ignored him. He asked us not to choose it. We chose it anyway. And then, on the backside, he chose to rescue us from it. He comes to rescue us from this. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. That's our God. Not the one who causes death. That's Satan. That's the result and wage of sin. Our God brings life through Christ Jesus. We are adopted as children. Here's another thing to know that's true. We are adopted as children, and he wants it that way. Into his family, he wants it that way. Ephesians 1.15 says, He predestined for, uh, for adoption to sonship through, Christ, through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. He makes us his children, and it's what he wants. It makes him happy. The reason I don't want my dead baby to be an angel is because I want my child to be a child of God and his family, and that is way better. Way better. The theology of heaven and the afterlife is difficult and scary and vague, and so we have to look and grasp at what we know that's true. I know that this is a somewhat overused verse, but John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. We're not going to stay like this in our hell, but have eternal life and freedom. Freedom. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it. He did not come here to live out those kingdom ways of chains. He sent us, sent him into the world to save the world through him. The blessing is freedom from that hell. When you do those things above and you provide comfort to somebody who's in mourning, you are a part of Christ's kingdom. You might think that that's a lot of pressure on you and your casserole. But if that, if mourning and death is an image of hell and breaking the chains and these ways are an image of heaven, whose image are you? Image. We are made in God's image. He can use you in these ways, in his ways. So try this. Grief, instead of what I said before, grief on this earth is really terrible. It's every bit as awful and scary as you think it is, as you're afraid of. Because it's the image and the reign of Satan that still reigns on this earth. That's what it is. It's scary and it's hard. But God is so good that within his kingdom, his ways are to provide comfort and free, to provide freedom these are his ways to provide freedom for that, and he came to do it, to break us from the chains of bondage of that hell. And he will provide this fully when he returns, and he will provide it, and he seeks to provide it in part now through us in his chosen kingdom here on this earth. The reason that we're blessed through mourning is because we fully grasp the depth of hell. And then we are released from it which means that we fully grasp the glory of heaven. If you've never been bound, then you don't know what it's like to be released. Kevin and I received, and we still receive the blessing and glimpses of Christ's freedom and pain and bondage to grieve every time someone who is living here in the kingdom ways toward us. We are given freedom from that bondage. So where can you give, live, and give comfort. How can you do this? What does that look like? Where can you walk in kingdom ways here and now surrounding grief and mourning? 
What expectations can you let go of surrounding someone who is mourning? Do you have them on a timeline? Do you wish that they would stop talking about it? Do you wish that they wouldn't bring it up at Christmas? Can you let them go of that and tell them? Where can you withstand being uncomfortable? Oh, sorry, this should say uncomfortable. Where can you withstand being uncomfortable in order to free the mourner from expectations that are putting you first? Can you look them in the eye? Can you use the person who passed away's name? How can you show it? If you are the one that is mourning, we do this to ourselves. This wasn't all other people. This was us too. Because it's ingrained, it's taught. If you are mourning, what expectations can you let yourself become free of? Can you let yourself be free to mourn? What areas of your life do you wish you were more free to mourn? Who can you talk to about that? If you need me later, I'll be